This is one of the most recognizable stock charts of all time. Well, it almost is, except there's one day missing. Without that day, it's already pretty interesting. Things start out calm, get frothy toward the middle, and then mostly go back to normal, except at a price about $100 higher than before. Now, let's add that day back in and see what happens. It's the fall of 2005 in Germany, and Porsche announces its intention to acquire 20% of the voting shares in Volkswagen. The two companies have an extremely complicated history together, originating from Ferdinand Porsche, who f both founded Porsche and designed the iconic Beetle for Volkswagen. His descendants are major shareholders and executives at both companies. From a strictly business perspective, the companies are intertwined because Porsche relies on Volkswagen for some of its manufacturing. Porsche's reason for seeking this position is their concern that Volkswagen may be a target for a takeover attempt. The company had been floundering recently, making it potentially vulnerable, and there was no guarantee that any new ownership would continue with the manufacturing arrangement, so Porsche is protecting its interests. Until recently, the idea of Volkswagen being taken over would not have been a concern at all. Germany has a high threshold for takeover attempts requiring a 75% quote, domination of shares before a company can be fully under control of the acquirer. But Volkswagen, and only Volkswagen, has an even higher requirement. Written in 1960, when Volkswagen became a private entity, the Volkswagen Act required 80% ownership. This 5% difference was critical since the German state of Lower Saxony held 20.2% of shares. Unless Lower Saxony would sell, no one could take over the company. So then, what was Porsche worried about? Well, the Volkswagen Act seemed to be out of step with the laws in the European Union. If it was overturned, then it would be possible for Lower Saxony to be overrun. Don't worry though, says Porsche the following January. We're not planning on acquiring more than a 22% stake in the company. A year passes and Porsche decides that actually, maybe it likes the idea that the Volkswagen Act can be overturned. The company has now amassed a position of just over 20% with options taking it to 25.1%. The reason it's changed its tune on the act is that although the legislation is preventing a takeover, the act also has a provision preventing any shareholder from voting more than 20% share, regardless of their total holdings. If Porsche take their holdings up to the 25.1%, then they'll be able to block any takeover attempt themselves by stopping entities from getting over the 75% domination threshold. Plus, they will have a voice in business decisions equal to the full size of their holdings instead of being limited to just 20. Don't worry though, says Porsche in November. We're not planning on acquiring more than a 30% stake. In March 2007, Porsche announces they've amassed a 30.9% position in Volkswagen. At this level, German law requires they make a buyout offer. They offer the legal minimum, guaranteeing it will be rejected, and continue to state that their interest is in protecting Volkswagen from hostile takeover attempts. Later that year, in October 2007, the Volkswagen Act is overturned. A hostile company would only need 75% ownership to take over Volkswagen, and Porsche's shares voting rights would no longer be capped at 20%. The following spring, Porsche gets approval from its board and publicly announces their intention to secure a majority position in Volkswagen shares. Over 50% this means. Don't worry though, they say a week later. We're not planning on acquiring more than 75% of the company.
so the trap was laid. Heading into October 2008, the investing world looked at Volkswagen and couldn't believe their luck. While the financial system was melting down all around them, automakers included, Volkswagen shares kept rising. And they were sure they knew why. It was because Porsche kept buying them. Once Porsche finished buying, supply and demand for shares would be dictated again by business fundamentals instead of on one entity's relentless push for voting rights. And, thanks to the global recession, fundamentals were terrible. In America, General Motors would be bankrupt in under a year's time. This on its own was an enticing setup for short sellers, who are people who bet that a stock price will fall. But there was one other factor that made it irresistible to hedge funds in particular, so much so that the short position in Volkswagen represented over 12% of all shares. Volkswagen, as well as many German companies, traded in ordinary and preferred shares. The basic difference was that their ordinary shares had voting rights, while the preferreds did not. This is similar to how Alphabet, parent of Google, trades under two different symbols. And if you look at a chart, you can see that the price movement of these is barely distinguishable. In Germany in 2008, however, since Porsche was only pursuing the voting shares, the gap was big and it was only getting bigger. This situation presented the hedge funds with, well, a hedge. They could short the ordinary shares while buying along the preferred shares. In doing so, they isolated themselves from the actual financial performance of Volkswagen. It no longer mattered if Volkswagen miraculously flourished. In that case, the preferreds would rise and offset the losses from the short on the ordinary shares. The hedge funds were simply betting that the price of ordinary shares would fall relative to the preferreds. Thanks to this hedge, the trade was viewed as nearly riskless. Porsche demand for voting shares was distorting the market, and their demand would have to end eventually by them either gaining full control or running out of funds to purchase additional shares. Once that pressure was off, the ordinary and preferred shares would converge because they would go back to representing the fundamentals of the company. In the meantime, what was the worst that could happen? Well, they found out. On October 26, 2008, Porsche finally showed their hand. They put out a press release stating, quote, At the end of last week, Porsche SE held 42.6% of the Volkswagen ordinary shares, and in addition, 31.5% in so-called cash settled options. Assuming the economic framework conditions are suitable, the aim is to increase to 75% in 2009, paving the way to a domination agreement. The disclosure should give so-called short sellers, meaning financial institutions who have betted or are still betting on a falling share price in Volkswagen, the opportunity to settle their relevant positions without rush and without facing major risks." End quote. That last part was probably hilarious to Porsche. They knew what they had done. While slowly accumulating Volkswagen shares and making the necessary periodic disclosures of their positions, they had been secretly constructing a massive options position in such a way that did not require disclosure. The last anyone knew, Porsche had a 35% stake in Volkswagen. Now, they effectively controlled 75% of the stock, if not yet 75% of the votes. The gap between the ordinary and the preferreds was going to grow, and so people were going to want to exit their positions, or were going to be forced out by margin calls. Their problem was that to exit a short position, a short seller must become a buyer of the stock. If one person or firm does this, it doesn't really matter. If many shorts are doing this at the same time, a short squeeze happens because when everyone tries to exit their positions at the same time, it creates a wave of buying. This pushes the share price higher, which causes more shorts to have to exit their position, which creates even more buying, and so on. What made the Volkswagen situation special was that from the outset, there were nowhere close to enough shares available to buy to exit short positions. Remember, 12% of shares were short. Contrast that with the fact that Porsche had tied up 74.1% of shares and Lower Saxony still held their 20.1%. And various indices like the German equivalent of the Dow Jones Industrial Average held a few percentage. It's speculated that combined, 
there was as low as 1% of shares truly available. And to make matters worse, everyone knew. It's like if people were being allowed to set prices on lifeboats off of the Titanic and the passengers knew there weren't going to be enough to go around. No price was going to be too high. The share price exploded over the course of the next two days and hedge funds lost billions on their riskless trades as share prices rose from the 200s all the way up to $999. At the peak of the squeeze, Volkswagen was the most valuable company in the entire world. The pressure only relented on October 29th when Porsche decided to make 5% of the shares they held available for purchase. They said that they were doing this in order to, quote, avoid further market distortions and the resulting consequences for those involved, end quote. There may have been an ounce of truth to it, but this action of selling shares had the very notable side effect of netting them billions of dollars in profits, since the shares they were offering were purchased at significantly lower prices. Porsche's gains were so massive that at their year-end, multiple headlines were written uh, saying that Porsche is just a hedge fund company that happens to produce cars. Had all of this not taken place in the middle of a brutal recession, the conclusion to this story would be pretty straightforward. Porsche would own Volkswagen, and that would be that. But Porsche doesn't own Volkswagen, so what happened? Well, even with the extra billion squeezed from the short sellers, Porsche didn't have the cash to simply buy all the shares they needed. They had been purchasing most of them by taking out loans, and the normal plan would have been to keep increasing their debt until they had what they needed. Porsche had decent cash flows that would normally make them a safe bet for repayment even if they got themselves a little overextended. In the climate of 2008 and 2009 though, banks weren't taking any of these sorts of risks. Porsche was further tantalized by the fact that if they could just get to 75% ownership of Volkswagen, they could count VW's more than $10 billion in cash as part of their balance sheet to get back on a more stable financial footing. They had come so far, and yet, early in 2009, Porsche found themselves stalled out with just over 50% of shares purchased, with no more cash and no one willing to lend. Worse, some of the earlier loans that they had taken out to buy shares were coming due, and banks were unwilling to refinance. And just like that, the hunter became the prey. Not only did Porsche not have the cash for shares, they didn't have the cash to satisfy their financial obligations. It was possible that they would have to declare bankruptcy. Then, a savior came into the picture and bought them some breathing room by loaning them a billion dollars. That savior was Volkswagen. They were able to use part of that 10 billion that Porsche had so coveted to send out a lifeline. A few months later, Porsche needed even more money, and this time Volkswagen's help came with strings attached. Porsche had to allow itself to be acquired by Volkswagen, and Porsche had no choice but to accept. The resulting corporate structure is a little more complicated than simply Volkswagen owning Porsche, since Porsche did own over 50% of Volkswagen, but effectively, that's what happened. So, Porsche enacted a secret plan to take over Volkswagen, annihilated short sellers like nothing the world had ever seen before, and ended up the property of their original target. That's a moment in stock history. Thanks for watching, guys.